You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Sonic Summer Stock Playhouse. Good evening, sir. Oh, you can really feel autumn in the air, Maurice. Well, it's nice to be back at the playhouse again tonight. Oh, I can see that they're already building a display for next year. No, no, wait. Oh, hello. That's apparently a display for the upcoming Ultimate Sonic Summer Stock. The world's first modern audio drama conference right here in Halifax from the 24th to the 26th of July, 2020. It looks like they're building the ticket box all this week at mad-con.com. I know that Jack and Brian have been hard at work, and now Matt Leong has volunteered his artistic wizardry to help provide the graphics and colour to the site. This should be an exciting new launch. Oh, (laughs) ah... Well, speaking of launch, I had best launch myself to my seat. So as we begin to round up our ninth annual Summerstock Playhouse season, I'll have to make a note to speak to Jack about what we can do with our 10th anniversary next summer. For now, though, I think we can all get comfortable as Scott Mosher and Richard Summers present two features from CNY Table Reads, both science fiction classics, beginning with the timeless... Pardon the pun, the time machine, and finishing with the flashy, yep, again, Flash Gordon. Here we begin. See you at the end credits. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape with us now to the year 100,080 and a world where beauty and terror live side by side. As H.G. Wells describes it in his immortal story, The Time Machine. Dudley, you must be mad. A time machine? Yes, my friend, a time machine. This thing? This very thing. This contraption? This framework made of quartz and bronze and ivory? With its levers and its dials and its nest in the middle? This is the result of three years of hard work? I promise you, Fala, that on this machine, a man can go wherever he likes in time. By working these levers, a man can choose his century his year, his very day. Oh, for really, old man? Time is only a kind of space. If we can move about in all the other dimensions of space, why not in time, too? Oh, it's impossible. Out of the question. Well, what are the journeys I've already taken on this little contraption? I'm afraid you've been having a bad dream. Very well. You shall have proof, my friend. How? Just climb on, Fala. Sit in the seat beside me, face these ivory dials, and I'll take you for a little spin. Well, you you mean right now? Right now. In case this thing should take off like a flying red horse, are there any, um, any... Any preparations? No, Fala. You won't need any luggage on this trip, not even a toothbrush. We'll be back here in my laboratory in less than a minute. All right. I'm on. Now what? Hold tight. It sways a good deal. I'd hate to lose you. (laughs) I can't be frightened, Dudley. Then you're braver than I am. Tell me, what time is it? It's, um, just 12 noon. Before we start, I want to adjust this control a bit. Hmm. 
Is everything shipshape? Tell me, did you notice anything just then? Only a noise, a humming noise,、uh, nothing else. What time is it? You just asked me, old man. It's twelve. That's odd. My watch says eleven o'clock. I could have sworn it was noon a moment ago. There must be something wrong with it. It's only that I touched the lever to test it, and we've gone forward a full day. Twenty-three hours, at any rate. But Dudley, this will be the real article. I'm ready, Dudley. Good man. Well, say goodbye, Fala. Say goodbye to nineteen hundred and fifty. We went off with a shattering jar, with the machine swaying under us. The walls of Doctor Dudley's laboratory suddenly fell away. Night was speeding after day, like the flapping of a flight wing. I saw the sun hopping across the sky, leaping swiftly across it every second, and every second marking a day. I saw the moon spinning through the quarter like a ball, from new to full, all in a twinkling of an eye. Trees grew and blossomed like puffs of smoke, and then passed away. All for the while we were going faster. Now our pace was a year a second. So that second by second, the white snow flashed across the world and was followed by the bright, brief spring. And still, we went on into the future. How do you feel, Fala? Very weak, very dizzy. Don't let go. Don't fall off. W- where are we? How far have we come? We're in one hundred thousand and fifty and sixty-seven. Th- that's enough. Stop it. I can't stand it any more. Stop it, Fala. You all right? Y- yes, I-, I believe so. No broken bones. What happened? Not sure. Must have stopped too suddenly. Where are we, Dudley? Look around for yourself. A wide lawn, a beautiful vast garden. I, I mean, geographically. Just where we were when we started, where my laboratory stood. And the year, Dudley? What is the year now? One hundred thousand and eighty. It seemed absolutely incredible, a dream, and a pleasant one, for the garden in which we found ourselves was beautiful and summery, with an unexpected perfume about it, almost like platine. At some distance, we could see a large and imposing building, and everything was quiet and peaceful, but almost too much so. And a sense of strangeness, an incredible strangeness, sent a shiver up my spine. One hundred thousand and eighty. Fala, do you want to go back?、Um, yes, I rather think I do. Let's go back. Dudley, from over there in the bushes, it sounded human. Come on. Why? Why? It's a child. Seems to be a very small girl. There's been a beast here of some kind of struggle with her. Look at the marks on her arm. Now, now, my dear, you'll be all right now. You won't be harmed. Of course, she wouldn't understand English. She's motioning us to go with her. What about the animal? Did you see it? No, not a glimpse. Too fast for us. Perhaps we better go back, Dudley. The girl seems to be all right now. Leave her like this. Yes, yes, I've had enough. Well, they haven't, old man, because they're here, all around us. They had crept up on soundless feet to surround us, the little people of this era, and the girl we saved was not a child, but a full-grown woman. They all stood four foot high in simple tunics, beautiful creatures, but terribly frail. With a plump and soft kind of frailty, they were like eerie figures in a dream, and all we could hear was the rustling of their clothes as they circled happily around us, their faces weaved in smiles. Why, they're not savage at all; they're very loving and gentle little people. Yes, 
There's something terribly wrong with them. Well, how do you mean? They seem to have the minds of five-year-olds. Well, how do you expect them to be? Far ahead of us, of course. Incredibly ahead of us in knowledge and science. Look at them. Children. They seem to be happy in this huge garden of theirs. Uh, Dudley, I've changed my mind. Let's stay. Maybe we should enjoy spending a few days with our little friends. The little people led us home into their valley. They lived in colossal buildings, sleeping all together in one huge hall, eating in another, playing and frolicking in the sunshine. And we lived with them for days in utter contentment. One afternoon, Dudley and I walked along the banks of the great river. The little people all wear the same clothes, the same soft, hairless skin, the same feminine roundness of limbs. I wonder if it's because they're all vegetarians. They're vegetarians because they have to be. You haven't come across any horses or dogs or cattle of any kind, have you? No, now that you mention it. With good reason. All extinct by now. Just as the dinosaur is with us. Dudley, there's something strange here. Something hidden away. Silent. You're in the year 100,080. I felt the same way. I've taken the precaution of removing the control levers of the time machine and putting a master padlock on the main switches. I don't much fancy the idea of someone riding away with it into another century and leaving us here for the rest of our lives. Um, Dudley, do you know where we are? Uh, yes, this is where we landed. I thought so. I wasn't sure. Why did you ask? What's happened to the machine? What? They've taken it away. They've stolen it. This is where it was. It was right here. Look. Fala. Tracks. Here, where they drag it. Over here. Come along. Down this path. Look. Right there. The monument. Those are brass doors on the base. Oh. uh, They're locked. The machine. It must be in there. Yes. Inside. We must get in there. Break down the doors. How? How can we? Here. Use the ladders. All right. I'll try. It's it's no good, Dudley. They're solid. We'll never break through. Never? Never? We've got to break through. We may never go home again. Time machine. Time machine. We were caught in the year 100,080. The time machine was gone. The brass doors of the monument held. Our retreat was cut off. The thin line by which we could make our way back home. Back to our own time. Our own people. Back to 1950. And we had no way of communicating with the little people. Of asking them what they had done with the machine. There was nothing hostile in their attitude. They were more like simple, wandering children. Only one, the young woman, Wena, whose life we had saved on the first day, became really friendly. She went with us wherever we walked and brought us garlands and flowers and slept near us at night in the hall. And we in turn had taught her a few words in English. Now we redoubled our efforts, like men racing against the clock so that we might speak to her and discover the secret of our immense loss. We were talking to her one night after the others had gone to sleep. No, not we, Dudley, no. How can you be so sure your people didn't steal the machine? Aren't there any thieves among them? Are they all perfect? Not so loud, Dudley. You'll wake them. Besides, she doesn't understand. The thief must be sleeping somewhere in this hall. Weena. They take machine. No, Dudley, no. Who, then? Who? We are friends. Yes. 
We must have machine. Yes, Dudley, yes. Who took machine? Other people? Not yours? Other? What about those doors, Winna? Doors. Open? No, no. Weena, machine. In there, must open. No, no, not open. All right, go to sleep. Get some rest. Yes, Dudley. What's to become of us, Fala? Are we caught here in this century to spend our lives with the little people and their secret? We'll go back to the monument tomorrow. We'll find a way of breaking in. Good night, Dudley. Uh, Dudley? Dudley? Yeah? Did you just... There it was again. What? Something on my face. Cold. Filthy to the touch. On my face and in my hair. It's cold. It's death, Dudley. You're right. There's something in here with us. Smells of the grave. What was it? I, I don't know. But look at them. L look at the little people. It's as though they've been stampeded. Let's get out of here. I want some fresh air. We went quickly from the hall and outside, away from the little people. The moon was full just overhead and it was close to dawning. There was a faint sound speeding close behind us and we turned, our nerves ragged, our muscles tensed, but it was only Weena coming swiftly to join us. Dudley, I'm afraid. Dark. What do you mean, Weena? Dark? What? Then there is something. Dark things. Dark places. Night. Why should they be afraid of the night, Dudley? It's not the night alone. Dark place. That's our clue. Perhaps it's something underground. It was another day. We had wandered in a lovely wooded place, about a mile from the community. Suddenly, Weena screamed. Stella! We stopped short. A pair of glaring eyes were fixed upon us. As we stood there, petrified, the thing, a little ape-like figure, rushed across our path and disappeared in the clearing about thirty yards away. What was it? I couldn't see it too well. It seemed to be a dull white with white hair on its head and on its back. It looked like a small ape. It was running on all fours, with its arms held very low. Weena, Weena, what was it? Morlocks, a Morlocks. Who are the Morlocks? Where are they? What are they? Weena, tell me. No, no. Let's go over and see where it disappeared. Come along, Fala. In the clearing, we found a round, well-like opening. Dudley and I leaned over and looked down a deep shaft. A small white creature was retreating down a ladder in the well. Like a human spider, its large white eyes watching me as it went swiftly down, then it disappeared in the shaft. Fala, did you see it? Like an ape? Yes, but also like a man. So there are two species of men in this world. Yes. The little people above the ground, and this obscene thing, this bleached monster below. That white look, common to animals that live in the dark, like huge rats, like worms that are cold to the touch. I know, because they've touched me. Fala, you can feel the air being sucked down into the shaft? Yes. The earth must be tunneled enormously here under our feet. These monsters must live in the tunnels. I think we know now who stole our time machine. Yes, then... Then we'll go down and have a look. No. No, not go. Why not, Weena? Morlocks, you never come back. We must have our machine, my dear. You wait for us here. No, no. And so we went down our heels ringing on the small, metallic bars that were meant for creatures so much smaller than us. Down we climbed, down, down, ever in darkness, 
ever it seemed, into the center of the earth, into the core of the world. How much longer? We won't know until we reach the bottom. Can't be much further. Do you hear that? Like machinery. We're almost there. Thank heaven for that. All right, Fala. I'm on the bottom. Come along. Just a few more steps. Now give me your hand, Fala. Good. We're here. Yes. In the land of the Morlocks. Do you have a match? Yes, here. There seems to be a large vaulted cabin at the end of this passage. What do you suppose they'll do if they catch us? I have no idea. Better take care not to be caught. Ah, another match. That that throbbing noise. Probably their ventilating system pumping the air down. There must be thousands upon thousands of these Morlocks living under the earth. We haven't seen any yet, except for our friend who came down ahead of us. Why do you suppose they wanted our time machine? I think they wanted us, not the machine. And we've come to them. We must. It's our only chance, Fala. If that noise does come from air pumps. Yes? Why, it's so stuffy here. So oppressive. Dudley, what's that smell? Blood. Light another match. Dudley, look straight ahead. On the white metal table. Set for a meal. Yes, with a small haunch, meat. We know that the cattle are extinct. Then what do they feed on, these Morlocks? Don't you know? Yes, I know. Oh, another match. Uh, Yes, right here. Dudley, I have no more. I've used our last match. All right, we'll have to go back. We know the secret now, anyway. Morlocks, living here underground that are masters of this age and our friends up above are fatted cattle fed by the Morlocks clothed, supplied and housed until the day when they're cut out of their herd and brought underground as food this is the future you're looking at this is what we men of the 20th century shall come to Dudley what is it? I felt hands cold hands take one of these ladders Yes, give it to me. Use it as a weapon. Lash out against it. Follow. They're here beside me. Use the ladder, man. Use the ladder. They're they're all around us. This way. Follow me this way. Back this way. We went back in that evil darkness, fighting every step as we went. Back to those projected bars, kicking and clawing ourselves loose from their taloned, groping hands. And climbing up again, up toward daylight and freedom, away from their stench and their eagerness of their icy hands. And they did not follow, for daylight was their enemy and their great fear. And we lived among the lush gardens of the little people, like prisoners, like men without reprieve, like men who are dead, though they still walk the earth. For the time machine was locked away behind great brass doors, and we knew we could never force them open. Then one day, Weena told us of an old building, an ancient sagging structure that had survived through many ages as one filled with many curious objects. A museum. That's what it must be. A museum, Fala. Perhaps from some earlier time. I'm in no mood to go looking at a museum. Don't you see? Specimens are medically sealed in museums. Perhaps there are things, weapons, machinery, something we can use. Yes, yes, of course. If we could find some dynamite or gunpowder or something. We could blast those doors. We could get in. Where is this place, Weena? This old building that no one ever goes near. I take you, it not far. A chance, old man. A slim one, but a chance nonetheless. All day we wandered through the great ruined halls. The building had been deserted, unused for perhaps a century. The childlike men of the time had long since ceased to care about anything but their own personal comforts. It was late afternoon and growing dark when we came upon the chemical section. 
We had found nothing useful to us until then. Now came the worst disappointment of all. And it's dust. All of it. It's been dust for centuries. Another dead end. It's hopeless. We were out of our minds to hope that nitrites would retain their form for a hundred thousand years. We go now, if nothing here. Wait, just a moment. There's something in this case. Well, you it, can break it with your lever. Stand back a little. A box of matches. Medically sealed. Wait, let me see it. Why, they're perfect. They're not even damp. What should we do with them? Burn down those brass doors? Well, you'd better keep them. You can't tell. Fala. What? On the floor. You see them? Small, narrow footprints leading away into the darkness at the end of this gallery. Dudley! We better go. Pick Weena up and carry her. We're going to have to make a run for it. Now, now don't be frightened, my dear. It'll be all right. Go on, run. We came out of the gloom of that place into the deeper gloom of dusk, and suddenly we saw we were trapped. All around us were the Morlocks. They were there by the thousands, surrounding us and coming closer. The long, even line of deadly white, their eyes blinking in the half-light, their tiny mouths alive with appetite. Fala, the matches. I have the matches. Light a fire here. The forest is dry. Hurry, man. We'll have an inferno here in a minute. Our little friends don't like light or heat. The fire leaped high to the heavens, and the countryside was ablaze. The Morlocks turned in fear, blinded by the glare. Some of them plundered into the raging flames, and the rest faded away like a fog. Dudley had left a narrow passageway for our retreat, and we fled down a long corridor of leaping flames and blistering heat. We fled towards safety to the community of the little people. As we ran, we passed the huge monument with its great bronze doors that were locked tight in our time machine. And suddenly, in the glare of the distant fire, we saw something that stopped us short. They're open, Fala. The doors are open. No, not go in. Deadly, no. It's a trap. They're waiting for us inside. Waiting or not, we're going in. Dudley, it's suicide. It'll take me one minute to screw the levers on again. Then I touch them and we're away. All right. I'll try to give you your one minute. Good boy. No, no go. No, leave me. Now you, you my dear, you hold tight around my neck. You're coming home with us. All right, let's go. Wait, look, the machine. They haven't harmed it. I don't see them yet. Come on now, quickly. The doors, Dudley, they're closed. Ah, uh, get in the seat. I'll be ready in a moment. I waited for the hum that would signal our departure. There in the darkness, the Morlocks were finally upon us. Cold, persistent fingers swarmed over my body, tugging at me and sucking me away from the machine. I held tight to Weena as the man held tight to life, tried to kick them away with my feet. Fala! Fala! Hurry, Dudley, hurry! I must fix these levers quickly, or we're done. There, Fala. We're away. We're gone. Yes. Yes, we made it. Are you all right? I'm all right. Good. And Weena? Weena isn't with us. What happened? They tore her from my hands. The last minute, they got her. I tried to save her. I couldn't. I still have a piece of her tunic here in my fist. A little piece of her tunic. Nothing more. And so we came home again. Back into the very minute in which we'd left. Back into 12 noon, October 22nd, 1950. We were in Dudley's laboratory again, motionless, sitting on the ridiculous contraption which he had called Time Machine. Was it all a dream? Did any of it happen? Could any of it happen? Of course not. How stupid! Then what of this? What of this piece of thin green silk I hold in my hand.
presenting, for the first time on radio, the amazing interplanetary adventures of Flash Gordon and Dale Arden. These thrilling adventures come to you as depicted each Sunday in the Comic Weekly, the world's greatest pictorial supplement of humor and adventure. The Comic Weekly, now printed in 12 tabloid-sized pages, each page in full four colors, is distributed everywhere as part of your Hearst Sunday newspaper. Racing high above the earth, comfortably seated in a giant airliner, Flash Gordon, internationally famous athlete, looks admiringly across the aisle at Dale Arden, the lovely young companion of his air voyage. The minds of both are intent on the terrible destruction, which for many months has been approaching the earth with terrific speed. The new planet, hurtling through space directly in the path of the earth. Suddenly, there is a violent jar. The plane lurches into a spinning nosedive. Flash Gordon's trained muscles carry him across the aisle to the frightened girl to gather her in his arms and then leap free of the falling plane and pulling the ripcord of his parachute glides to Earth. Don't be frightened, Dale. The plane has crashed. We're safe. Yes, thank you. Hold fast. We're landing now. Careful. Easy. <clears throat> Are you all right, Dale? Yes. Good. Oh, look, Flash. There's a large steel door. It's closing. Why, that's the laboratory of the great scientist, Dr. Hans Zarkov. He's coming this way. I'll call him to help us. Doctor! Uh, I hope you'll pardon us for breaking in on you so unceremoniously, Doctor, but you see, we had to bail out. I see you for what you are. Spies, come to steal my secrets. But I have the answer for that. Uh, Come with me. uh, Put the gun away, Professor Zarkov. (laughs) The man is mad, Dale. We'll have to humor him. Uh, All right, Professor, all right, we'll come with you. Get down this ladder. Into this tower. Down, I tell you. All right, all right. There now. We're in my rocket ship. And in ten seconds, we'll be on our way to the new planet. We will all die. Die for science. (laughs) breaking away from the Earth with the speed of light, right into the path of the new planet. Hold tight, Dale. We'll escape somewhere. To the new planet! (laughs) The new planet! We three will save the Earth! Uh, Dr. Zarkov, there's still time to swing your rocket ship out of the path of the new planet. No! No! (laughs) What will you gain for science if we're all killed in the crash? I know who you are, Flash Gordon. The world's greatest athlete. But your trained strength will not save you. Only my mind, the mind of Zarkov, the scientist can save you. Can save any human soul upon the earth. The turbo drive. He's reaching for the control. Stand aside, Zarkov. <laughs> Feel it. The gravitational pull of the new planet. We crash in five seconds. <laughs> the rocket ship hits the planet. Dr. Zarkov and Dale are thrown from the rocket ship, unconscious. Flash is thrown clear of the wreckage and lands on his feet, uninjured. He rushes to the side of the unconscious girl, picks her up, and starts to carry her toward the distant towers of a city on this weird new planet. Suddenly, strange soldiers armed with ray guns appear, and capturing Dale and Flash, force them to come with them to the throne room of Ming the Merciless. Emperor of Mongo and supreme ruler of the universe. O oh, thou indulgent Ming, most merciless majesty of Mongo, supreme ruler of all the peoples of the new planet, thy slaves salute thee. Good! Ming shall want the earth people. Thy slaves obey, O oh Ming the merciless. Get your hands off me. I'm no slave. I'll meet your emperor as a free man and an equal. Uh, So, Earthman, you are a free man and my equal. Throw him to the red monkey man in the arena. I would be forced to make this free man my equal? There is thy freedom, Earthman. Now you go into the arena to meet the red monkey man of Mongoy. No! 
Don't worry, dear. Emperor Ming, I will show you that I, a free man from the earth, are more than a match for your brainless red monkey men. Flash reaches the bottom step leading to the arena. He leaps and swings at the nearest red monkey man. Then, grasping the fallen man-beast under the armpit, Flash whirls him around in a flail, knocking the others in all directions. Emperor Ming, fearing that his monkey men will all be killed, orders his soldiers to destroy Flash with their ray guns. In the midst of the confusion, Princess Aura, the beautiful young daughter of Emperor Ming, calls to Flash. Quick, brave Earthman, this way. Here to my balcony. Flash leaps to the royal balcony and joins the gorgeously jeweled princess, who commands the slaves to keep back while she takes Flash through a secret door and into a passage leading to a private elevator. The two get in, and Aura closes the door and presses the switch. Who are you, beautiful maiden? I am the Princess Aura, the only daughter of Ming the Merciless. Princess, I owe you my life. You are brave and handsome and strong. You must not end so young. I have never seen anyone like you, Earthman. Where I come from, Princess, there are many stronger men and better looking. But tell me, Princess, where are you taking me? I am taking you to my private landing frame of my own rocket car. There you will be safe. We have arrived, Earthman. Get in this rocket car. No one will harm you. But, Princess, I don't... Hurry! Hurry! But, Princess Aura, how am I to rescue the Earth Girl, Dale Arden? That is why you are in my private rocket car, Earthman. Why? What do you mean? Dale Arden can never be rescued by you. But, Princess, I... As for you, Earthman, you shall love me or die. Meanwhile, back in the palace, Emperor Ming is talking with Dale Arden. Your companion, Flash Gordon, has escaped, but not for long. My men will soon capture him. What are you going to do with me, Emperor Ming? You are pleasing to me, Earth Woman. You will become my wife. Never! I do not love you. We men of Mongo have no human traits, no love, no mercy, and no kindness. Whether you love me or not makes no difference. You shall become my wife as soon as the ceremony can be arranged. Your Majesty, look into the spatiograph. Our city is being bombarded by the space gyros of the Lion Men. The Lion Men? Order the entire space fleet to attack. In the terrific battle which takes place between Emperor Ming's space fleet and the gyros of the Lion Men, the attacking gyros are driven off. The rocket ship in which Flash Gordon has been held captive is destroyed, and Flash is thrown to the ground, unconscious. He opens his eyes to find himself staring into the great bearded face of Thun, Prince of the Lion Men. Thun lets his great sword fall as he sees Flash Gordon's white skin. Who art thou, white-skinned youth? Speak. Answer me before I cleave thy white body in pieces. Art thou a new kind of soldier of Ming, the Merciless? I am the sworn enemy of that fiend Emperor Ming. He has captured a girl who is from Earth like myself. I live only to rescue her. An Earth man, thou sayest? Yes. And an enemy of Ming the Merciless? That's right. Tell me, are you friend or enemy? I am Thun, Prince of the Lion Men, hereditary enemies of the men of Mongo. If thou would accept me as thy friend, Earth man, I will gladly join thee against Ming the Merciless. Here's my hand on it then, Prince Thun. Good. What is thy name, Earthman? I am called Flash Gordon upon the earth, your highness. Call me Thun, friend, and I will call thee Flash. Friend Thun, do you know how we can gain admittance to the palace that we may rescue Dale Arden? Come, I will show thee a secret way into the palace. Good. The Emperor Ming is away pursuing my gyro fleet. We may be able to rescue the Earth Girl before Ming's return. Flash Gordon and his powerful newfound friend go first to the space gyro of Prince Thun, and there they gaze intently into the thought projector, in which they not only see Dale Arden captive, but they also have revealed to him a secret way leading into the throne room of the palace. 
The secret passage is known as the Tunnel of Terror because of the deadly beasts which lie within its gloomy walls. Fighting each step of the way, Flash and his new friend Prince Thun finally find themselves within the palace. A door with great steel bolts stands before them. Quick, Thun, this door must lead directly to the center of the palace. From my memory of the palace, I should say that beyond this door is the great throne room of the Emperor Ming. All right, then. Here we go. Ah, there. You're right. Thun, it is the throne room. Yes, this great statue before us is the God of Death, which stands at the top of the altar steps, directly behind the throne of the Emperor. Listen, Thun, what's that? By the great God Pau, it is the royal wedding procession. Ming the Merciless is taking another bride. He's coming up the altar steps, Thun. I'm going to look around the idol. To look around the idol means death. Thou must not. Come back. Come back, Flash. Save yourself. I'm going to rescue my Earth friend, Dale Arden. She's being forced into a marriage with Ming the Merciless. Prince Thune of the Lion Men does not save himself at the expense of his friends. If thou must die, I will die fighting with thee. Dale, this way. Dale. After them. This, this way, Dale. Down this passage. Earthling, and as fast as you can run. Quick, you! They're swarming the altar steps. Help me topple the idol over on them. Now! One, two, three! <laughs> With a grinding crash, the giant idol topples over onto the onrushing soldiers of Ming the Merciless, killing those in front and throwing into confusion the whole company. Flash Gordon and Prince Thun, with Dale between them, dash into the secret passage beneath the idol. The way becomes steeper. They slip and fall down, down, a hundred feet or more into a whirling underground river. They're swept along down a raging current and over a falls into a lake. With the powerful strokes of a champion swimmer, Flash sets out for the shore, towing Dale by the hair. They reach the shore. And as Flash reaches down to drag Dale to safety, she screams and disappears beneath the calm surface of the lake, clutched in two powerful green scaly arms. With no thought of his own safety, Flash Gordon dives to Dale's rescue and finds an adventure stranger than any which has gone before. Follow the thrilling adventures of Flash Gordon and Dale Arden each Sunday in your Hearst Sunday newspaper. You will find them graphically portrayed in full-color pictures in the Comic Weekly. Only in the Comic Weekly can you follow the escapades of the Katsunyama kids, those perennial rascals, or thrill to the adventures of King of the Royal Mounted. Only in the Comic Weekly can you enjoy the good, clean fun of bringing up Father, Tilly the Toiler, way out west, the Little King, or in the language of his hillbilly friends, those clean catawampus over the bodacious goings-on of Barney Google. Your old friend Skippy and all his little pals are waiting for you in the Comic Weekly, along with Pinky, Molly, and Pat in their great adventure story, Radio Patrol. And there is Ace Drummond, the Demon Aviator, Johnny Round the World, and many, many others. Be sure you get this big 32-page all-color comic weekly supplement with your copy of next Sunday's Hearst newspaper. And don't fail to listen next week to the continuation of the amazing interplanetary adventures of Flash Gordon and Dale Arden.
Oh, a lasting applause from the crowd here in Halifax as CNY Table Reads bids us adieu one final time on the summer stock stage. Thanks so very much to Scott Musher, and it certainly won't be the last time we hear from him as Scott will be releasing a new adaptation from EVP, The Most Dangerous Game, for our Sonic Society Season 14 premiere in two weeks. Next week, however, is foremost on our minds, and I look forward to seeing you here at the Playhouse as we have one last double feature from Narada Radio Company and the Amigos Collective. Until then, be well. I'm David Alt. Thank you and good night. And that's this week's performance for the 2018 Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. All productions, performances, characters and scripts presented in the Playhouse belong strictly to their copyright holders, and no copyright infringement is assumed or intended. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is part of the Sonic Society podcast and Electric Vicuna Productions. Any shows that continue their run must have explicit permission from all parties involved. The Playhouse theme was written and performed by Sharon B. Join us next week at the Playhouse for another classic performance. I am your announcer, David Alt. Good night. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Chauncey Haworth, Mark Slade, and Lothar Tuppen, the demented minds behind the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour, bring you... Twisted Pulp Magazine. A journey beyond surreality to worlds you never knew or hoped existed. Worlds of the supernatural... Worlds of dark satire. Worlds of nightmarish futures. Twisted Pulp Magazine. If you thought the 21st century was weird enough already, think again. Twisted Pulp Magazine. A step beyond your grandfather's pulp. Available at digitalvaudeville.com. That's D-I-G-I-T-A-L-V-A-U-D-E-V-I-L-L-E dot com.